delighted to introduce John Hoffmeister, former president of Shell Oil, founder and CEO of Citizens for Affordable Energy, and author of Why We Hate the Oil Companies, Straight Talk from an Energy Insider in all of your conference bags. John is truly unique. His credentials include leadership of both traditional and alternative energy endeavors, from an investor all the way to having a consumer perspective. Think about it, six million people every day going to the Shell oil stations. John was named president of Shell Oil in 2005, heading the U.S. country, clean, uh, country leadership team, which included the leaders of all Shell businesses operating in this country. He became president after serving as group human resources director of Shell Group based in The Hague, Netherlands. John's business leaders participated in the inner workings of multiple industries over a 35-year career. He's held executive positions at GE, at Nortel, and at Allied Signal, now Honeywell. John has a few governing principles that I think you're going to hear about that really define his views on energy, on our future, and now how he spends his time. Number one, energy without affordability is a non-starter in this democratic market-based economy. And as a result, he started his nonprofit, Citizens for Affordable Energy, to ensure that affordability is front and president in every dialogue and debate about energy. And this public policy education firm promotes sound U.S. energy security solutions for the nation, including a range of affordable energy supplies. Number two, time. Time is an essential success factor for energy future, which is why he believes that politics and energy is the root cause of energy's dysfunctional and erratic strategic path forward in the U.S. that I referenced earlier. And finally, John also believes that if we don't change the governance of energy in the United States, we can be assured that China will eat our lunch on energy markets in the years ahead. John's message, as you'll hear, it's harsh, it's direct, but most of all, it's hopeful. It's hopeful that we can overcome the challenges that we face to create a 21st century energy system that delivers affordable and sustainable energy through this century and transitions us to future centuries. It's my privilege to introduce John Hoffmeister. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to be here today and to talk to you about what you love most, which is the future of energy. Let me start with some concerns, some concerns that are real and present concerns that will have significant implications on the way forward, regardless of what part of the energy sector you are a part of. I'm mindful of the fact that we've had eight presidents since Richard Nixon promote energy independence, Republicans and Democrats. I'm also mindful of the fact that 19 Congresses have supported each president's intentions with respect to energy independence. And as we all know today, we are more dependent on foreign sourced energy than when we started this conversation on energy independence in 1973 on the heels of the first Arab oil embargo. One reality will not change. It will not change today or tomorrow or next month or next year or the following year. It will not change for a considerable period of time. And that reality is this country needs 20 million barrels of crude oil to get through the day. That's 10,000 gallons a second to get through the day. Today, tomorrow, and all the wishful thinking and all the aspirational objectives that we may have for a longer term future have to accommodate today's reality of 10,000 gallons a second. In addition, 60 million cubic feet of natural gas per day. If we stack those cubic feet on top of each other, if we could, we go to the moon and back 25 times every day. 
1,200 train car loads of coal an hour. One train car load every three seconds, producing 49% of our electrons every day. And that day-to-day -day reality has to be a part of every consideration of whatever we do. We've heard some wonderful comments today, and I absolutely support directionally everything we have heard. But how we are going about this as a nation, whether you go back to the Nixon administration, jump to the Carter administration, the Reagan administration, the Clinton administration, the Bush, the two Bush administrations, and now the Obama administration, is we are going about this planlessly. Planlessly in the sense that any corporate or governmental organization that cannot design a plan around a short-term set of priorities, a medium-term set of priorities, and a long-term set of priorities is wishing into the wind. That's a harsh reality to put forward here to a group of so highly motivated and so obviously committed individuals. China has a plan. And if you dig into the EU, what you find is an EU five-pillar, 50-year plan. What you find in the Chinese instance are the succession of five-year plans, one after the other after the other. And we have a two-year and a four-year at best mental model of how public policy is organized and presented as a way forward. That doesn't discount the importance of each two-year or four-year cycle. But ladies and gentlemen, let's be clear to each other, let's be honest, energy extends over decades. That's the critical miss. Energy plans and implementations extend over decades. Decisions made in deep water drilling or decisions made on new power plants, new wind farms, solar farms, pipelines are decades long decision models. And the notion that we can change policy back and forth takes us exactly to what we read about last week with a publicly subsidized solar manufacturing company in Massachusetts pulling up stakes, saying thank you very much for the X millions of dollars that was granted in a tax subsidy and moving production to China because it's more predictable. It's more understood. It's more supported. I think the $80, million, $80 billion that was put forward in the first part of this new administration was brilliant. And its execution was pretty good. But let's be clear, $80 billion? $80 billion? In the world's largest economy? With the world's oldest energy system? The 20th century energy system is on its last legs. And $80 billion is a frittering number. Well intended, well executed. But in terms of the 21st century energy system, it's directional, but not material. That takes nothing away from the genius and the brilliance and the execution and the leadership of individuals. The system is the problem, ladies and gentlemen, and I want to shift into that. How big a problem the system is, the existing system versus the possible system versus the obstacles in the way of the 21st century energy system. I have great passion for the end game of a 21st century energy system that's available, affordable, and sustainable to the point of zero or no carbon by 2060. But the way we are going about it, we will never, ever get there, starting with today. Today, the Interior Department of the United States is operating like a committee to diselect the president. 
by shutting down drilling in a nation that needs 20 million barrels a day, by shutting down drilling for an extended indefinite period without the understanding or appreciating or caring perhaps of the consequences of that shutdown at a time of economic recovery, finally things working on economic recovery, which automatically means demand returns, at a time when Asian demand is unprecedented, at a time when we have a ceiling, a practical, geopolitical, and real ceiling on global crude oil production, to shut down one of the most prolific basins in the world is really to say to the American consumer, you don't matter. I've been articulating the fear that I have, and it is a genuine fear, that by the time we go to the polls towards the end of November, or in November of 2012, towards the end of that year, we could very well face $5 gasoline in much of this country. It becomes the number one pocketbook issue for voters going to vote. And the elected officials running for re-election or election for the first time, you know as well as I know, will make a banquet out of $5 gasoline in the face of actions taken in the last four years, which actually reduce production of domestic supply. The reality is we need 20 million. Today we produce seven. We're on our way to six. And if we're at six and we're importing 14 instead of 13, where do we get the extra million? From the global supply. And nothing's going to change the dynamic between now and 2012 on the amount of oil we're going to need in 2012. It could derail an emerging recovery because the pocketbook issue is so real in a country where the median wage is $38,000 a year. Half the people of this country make $38,000 or less, and they have to fork over from their hard-earned and very scarce disposable income. It's back to the letters I got in the 2007-2008 period from families sitting at kitchen tables saying, Mr. Hoffmeister, big oil man, you're making me choose between reducing my medicine intake by half so I can afford your gasoline to go to work. Or you are, choose, you are forcing my family to make choices between food and fuel. You don't have that right. I got those letters. They were real. They were earnest. That was during the 110th Congress. The 110th Congress did nothing to produce one more barrel of crude oil in this country. And the 111th Congress, well, didn't even produce an energy bill. The two-year, four-year mindset governing our energy policy is harming the world we live in today. And I believe that contrary to common view, high-priced gasoline is the highest risk, the greatest threat to the clean energy future that we could face because we will revert. We will revert to what we know in the face of such high prices because our democracy takes us there. And it is the will of the people that will ultimately determine who runs us, who governs us, I should say. And my biggest fear is the unwillingness to accept the today reality and do what we need today. In other words, do both what we need today and what we need to do tomorrow. So for the foreseeable future, we have to run this dichotomous energy system, which is to prolong the life of the 20th century system until such time as we have materiality and critical mass for the 21st century system, rather than just obliterate the old as fast as we can by strangulation through regulation, which is what the view of the industry is these days, 
We need regulations that enable the 20th century model to continue to work while we transition to a new system, which is why we need a plan. And why any plan that is not predicated on short, medium, and long-term planning details is not a plan. And in the energy space, a short-term plan is zero to 10 years. Well, that's multiple lifetimes for elected officials in many cases. But that's a short-term plan for energy, a medium-term plan 10 to 25 years, and a long-term plan 25 plus. And it's only if we're willing to do that as a nation will we get there. Now, these are not just empty words. Aspiring to some aspirational plan that comes from some deus ex making a solution to a Greek tragedy. We've got to get real about it. And how do we get real? In my view, we have got to address the current governance system, which from Nixon to Obama, for 19 Congresses has failed the nation. The governing system. I'm not talking about people and individuals who have dedicated their lives to public service. They have been obviated. They have been obstructed by a system that's bigger than they are. The system that I'm describing is the system where bitter partisanship gets in the way of consistency over time. A system where the complexity and the size and the fragmentation of the governance gets in the way of agreement. Example, do we really need 13 executive branch agencies to govern energy? Why 13? Why do so many different agencies have so much to say about the future of energy? But 13 is a relatively small number when you go over to Capitol Hill. Do we really need 26 congressional committees and subcommittees in both houses to govern energy on two-year cycles? Oftentimes with split political governance between the parties as we face in the 112th Congress. And don't forget every federal judge throughout the judiciary can make or break energy policy, regulation, or legislation based upon a case brought before that bench in the specifics of that case, which has national repercussions. So we have a federal system, ladies and gentlemen, that is democracy in action, that is constitutionally appropriate, and we, the voters, get to decide every two years, thank goodness, on our futures, but my point is it doesn't work for energy. It's not going to work for energy. A ninth president or a 20th Congress, I'm sorry, it's not going to make the difference. I have respect for the previous eight and for each Congress that existed because they did their best. That's what they do. But in the world's largest economy, with this kind of everyday demand, with the environmental responsibilities, as someone said this morning, for our children and grandchildren facing us square in the face, we know full well we cannot continue the 20th century system any longer than we have to as we convert to the 21st century system, which will look very different from the sources of energy to the sources of intelligence to the manner in which we use energy. Very different. But we're not going to get there on the path that we're on. So here's what I suggest. In the same way that in the 19th century and early 20th century, our predecessors faced this same conundrum, dilemma, and debacle in the monetary system of the United States of America, and we couldn't get industrialization off the ground because of the uncertainties of our monetary system, culminating in the default 
by the United States Treasury in, two, in 1907, in which J.P. Morgan and his friends bailed out the U.S. Treasury, a reverse of recent history, and then repeated the default again in 1912. In 1913, Congress took an extraordinary step, and President Wilson signed an extraordinary bill called the Federal Reserve Act. The Federal Reserve Act created an independent regulatory commission not prohibited by the Constitution, nor explicitly provided for in the Constitution, but took the brave decision to come to grips with a national central bank, with regional bank boards and a national board of governors appointed by the President with advice and consent of the Senate in pure democratic fashion, in which an expert group could run the commanding heights of the monetary system without regard to the flavor of the day political issues of the moment, without the two-year, four-year electoral cycle standing in the way of the decision-making authorities granted by Congress to the Board of Governors, and with 14-year terms, and with a chairman appointed every four years by the President, which includes a level of democratic check and balance, the Federal Reserve system in this country with its regional banks and its central bank have in fact created the world's largest economy. Nobody can dispute that. Has it been perfect? Absolutely not. Have we had human error judgments? Absolutely yes. Have we had recovery from those human error judgments? Absolutely yes. I'm suggesting it's time to take some American history and apply it in parallel to an industry just as important to the future of America as our monetary system and financial industry, just as critical to the sustained national security, economic security, and lifestyle choices that we prefer as citizens in a market-driven economy in a democratic manner, and that we apply that logic by law with presidential leadership through Congress whoever the Congress is, Republican or Democratic, whoever the President is, and we bring together the legal capacity to create an Energy Resources Board as an independent regulatory commission to do four things, four commanding heights authorities. Number one, set the parameters of the supply system over the next 50 years short, medium, long term. What sources of energy will supply this economy to what extent, in what time frame, over that period of time? How much hydrocarbon? Coal, oil, natural gas. How much nuclear? How much renewable? How much hydrogen? How much geothermal? How much tidal or hydropower? And over a 0 to 10, 10 to 25, 25 to 50 year period, these are the sources of supply which will, in fact, deliver more supply than demand because that's how we get affordability. We don't get affordability by cutting costs. Oil companies have been cutting costs for 100 years. Coal companies have been cutting costs for 100 years. Any of your startup Clean companies will be cutting costs as long as you exist. That's what companies do. They get more efficient with time. They cut costs. But we don't get affordable energy from cost cutting. We get affordable energy when the supply exceeds the demand. And so how do we organize the supply side so that the supply exceeds the demand as far into the future as we can see from which sources of energy? And then manage the back end of that to make it happen. The second commanding height, efficiency through technology. It's hard for the democratic system to make big, tough, difficult decisions on efficiency in the use of energy. Tomorrow I'll be at a meeting in Houston talking about superconductivity at the University of Houston. Essentially, zero friction in transmission. Wow. That reduces a lot of power plants into not needing them. Or one of my strong points of advocacy is the elimination of the internal combustion engine. 
We've had it. Somebody said 16% efficient this morning. I've been using the term 20%. In either case, that's not very efficient. It's 100 years old for Pete's sake. Can't we do better than the internal combustion engine? Well, yes, in part we can. But there are other sources. Not to exclude public mass transit as one of those sources of efficiency in a country that desperately needs it. But hydrogen fuel cell technology, battery technology, get rid of the internal combustion, cut the demand for crude oil by 40%. Technology for efficiency. Third, commanding height. Get the politics out of environmental management by giving it to the independent regulatory commission. I have great respect for Lisa Jackson. She's a wonderful person. She's a Shell scholar. And I've met with her on many occasions. Lisa is in the political battle of her lifetime with very big stakes around her, doing what she believes is right to do. But the forces going up against her are going to paralyze and constrict her ability to get things done. You can just watch it happening. But yet, who in this room or who in this country wants to leave their children dirtier land, dirtier water, or dirtier air? I've never met that person. We have got to deal with cleaning up gaseous waste, liquid waste, and physical waste in ways that just get the job done. We have the technology. Let's use it. But by politicizing it, we zigzag back and forth, and we don't get it done. Make it an independent part of an independent regulatory commission's authority, not the politics of the day. And fourth, you know, we all know, we have got to have the infrastructure that carries the energy from where it's produced to where it's consumed. The San Bruno example this morning was spot on. Those lives were forever changed because of a 50-year-old pipe. And with millions of miles of 50 or 40-year older or pipe under the ground, who's next? Nobody knows where the pipes are other than the companies that manage them and the conditions under which they were constructed 40, 50, 60 years ago, things have changed. It's my view, ladies and gentlemen, that there's one way and one way only to make this happen for America. I'm not very popular in Washington. I wasn't during the Bush administration, although I knew Sam Bodman well, and I knew others in the administration. I'm not very popular in the Obama administration. I admire the public service that people commit themselves to, but it's beyond their individual capacity to make a difference, and that's what troubles me. This is a big country. This is a big monster of a problem, and the solution of doing what we have been doing and trying to do it again 30, 40 years, one after the other, and it doesn't work, it's not the way to go forward. And so when I talk to members, when I talk to appointed officials, I don't get a good hearing, nor do I expect it, because they have a job to do. Therefore, I founded Citizens for Affordable Energy to do one thing. Go talk to citizens. Go talk to the citizens of this country who have the most at stake. Yes, you and your investors have a lot at stake. But every family, every person in this country has everything at stake in terms of the energy future. Like air and water, energy is a necessity of life in a complex 21st century environment. And if the citizens of this country can get their heads around the three elements of availability, affordability, and sustainability, we're there. If they can get their heads around the fact that over 40 years we've tried but let's acknowledge we haven't done the job. We have the knowledge, we haven't done the job. Let's change the paradigm to get the citizens of this country, not with a Republican solution, not with a Democratic solution, but let's get the citizens of this country, ladies and gentlemen, engaged and educated and concerned and motivated to deliver through their elected representatives an American solution. Thanks for listening.